Welcome to the Generation Hustle Podcast, the show that explores the world of business, entrepreneurship, and culture all centered around the millennial. On today's episode, we have quite the story. How did a marketing professional who had worked with large corporations co-found a startup where their platform helps professional accountants? Well, your guess would have been as good as mine, but today's guest, Adam, did just that when they launched Luminary, which is today known as LumiQ. We walked through Adam's journey of building one of Canada's most reputable professional development platforms for CPAs, how his corporate experience helped him scale LumiQ, and the ins and outs of what it takes to work with a startup and how to land a job with one. So that's enough for me. Let's get into the good stuff. We also want to give a special shout out to today's sponsor, Podcorn. So let me ask you this, you're a growing brand looking to partner with other companies to help scale your business, or you're like us, a podcast looking to brands to partner with. Like many business founders, you find it extremely difficult to find these opportunities. Well, that was their case originally for the Generation Hustle podcast before we started using Podcorn. Podcorn is a marketplace connecting podcasters to amazing sponsorship opportunities, such as host red ads, interview segments, topical discussions, and more. With Podcorn, there is no middleman. Podcasters of all size can browse and choose opportunities right on the platform, set their own rates, and collaborate with brands directly with no exclusivities. This opens up the opportunity for you as a business or a podcast to scale much faster. So what are you waiting for? Check out podcorn.com to start growing. Thank you again, again so much for being on this. Um, like we said, long history with you. Uh, I haven't met you in person, but I've, I've met you digitally through my email. So uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that. So thank you again. Uh, so we just wanted to talk to you kind of about your, your, your journey and your history and obviously uh, about Luminary, but um, we can kind of take it from the beginning here. Um, obviously, you've had a, a unique career in which you went from the corporate world to running a startup. Um, so can you start off by just talking to us through that kind of transition uh, from that world and how it helped you prepare for the startup world? Yeah, sure. So, um, A, thank you for inviting me on here, guys. I appreciate it. It's, it's, uh, it's really nice to chat. Um, you know, it's a big, I guess it's a big story. I mean, really, like, the, the stuff that I was working on uh, before we started Luminary, uh, you know, I was working at a big company, one of the biggest ad agencies in the world. And I think one of the things that those big companies really help with is um, helping young professionals learn about process, right? And you see it a lot with like young CPAs who work at, you know, whatever it's called, the big six, the big eight, big accounting firms. They just learn like the right way and the wrong way to manage projects and work with colleagues. And I think right. that that's just such a big part of being successful in your career, no matter what you want to do, whether you want to start a startup or whether you want to go work at a, a startup or work in a small, medium business. I think it's always, I've, at least I've noticed, it's easier to start at somewhere that's really big and then learn the ropes about how they do it because wherever you're going to go after is going to have less process and, and less of everything up bureaucracy, less everything else. And you're able to kind of take what you've learned doing that and, and reduce it or adapt it or apply it. I, I think also another thing with, with working in big companies is that, like, you can't, like you can't let people down, right? Like there's a lot on the line, there's big budgets, there's big projects, there's a lot of people watching you. And so you kind of learn, I don't know, I guess you kind of learn how to, how to deliver. For sure, for sure. It's almost like a trickle down effect, right? Like you learn the ropes in the corporate world and then kind of you, you bring it over with you. So what would like, uh, aside from the process, uh, what were like the key ingredients, so to speak, that you brought over into the startup world? I think, it was, <laughs> I mean, so when I, when I tell people that I was in advertising, they go, oh, like you created ads. And yeah. I'm like, no, like I was like on the account management side. Like I just, <laughs> I just was doing project management. Right. Um, you know, that's really what I was doing. And sure, you can manage an advertising project. You can manage an accounting project. You can manage whatever project you want. I think it's about staying on budget and deliverables and, and really being like that stakeholder manager, I, I think was one of the things that I really learned. But um, I remember right before, so about like a year before I left, I, I was like thinking, I was like, okay, I'm going to go, I want to go start my business sometime soon or start our business sometime soon. And so I went and, and the, the company that I was at just like was not giving me a raise and they were like, you know, are we allowed to swear on this podcast? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. 
they were giving me a lot of bullshit. Um, <laughs> I don't even know if bullshit's a swear word. But anyways, they were, they were giving me a lot of bullshit. Oh, we're going to raise your salary, blah, 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 blah. And they just weren't doing it. So I went out and got a job offer from another ad agency. And then I went back to the agency that I was working at. I was like, look, like they gave me this job offer. You know, like it's time to give me what I want. Like I'm done playing these games. And I didn't really want to go to the new agency because I knew I was going to leave within the next year to go do my own thing. And I, it just was more comfortable in a place <laughs> right. that I knew. So I actually ended up like um, negotiating to switch teams within the agency. I was on the MasterCard accounting team and they needed somebody to run Chevrolet sponsorship of Hockey Canada. Do you guys know like Timbits Hockey? Yep. Yeah. Yep. You know, like the little cute kids playing playing hockey and stuff. <laughs> right. So Chevrolet yeah. wanted, wanted in on that and they sponsored an age group within hockey Canada and they needed somebody to run that. And I was like, that's, that's what I want. Like I love sports. I want that job. And so they gave me that job. They still didn't, they were like, Oh, I'm like in three months, we're going to match your salary. Like, don't worry about it. And of course they never did. Or they gave right. me like five grand less or something ridiculous. Um, <laughs> but, but that was a really good experience. So we, we basically built like a hockey program for 11 and 12 year olds across the country. And Chevrolet's whole idea behind it was like, how can we not sell these people on Chevrolet's cars? Like, how can we just ingratiate ourselves in their lives? And we developed this whole program that was all about like, rewarding kids for good deeds. I don't know if you guys have ever seen like the good deeds Chevrolet cup on like sports channels and they run ads all the time now. Yeah. Um, and basically it was, it was rewarding kids for good deeds instead of scoring goals, which is kind of how kids are usually rewarded. And right. there was 3,500 hockey teams that were eligible to participate in this program across the country. And in the first six months, we signed up like 3,300 of them. Wow. And so it was a really good experience. Like now that we've gone up, that we, you know, looking back, we ended up building this huge community for chartered accountants. But really, I kind of had like a trial by fire building that community in the hockey world. Um, and so it all it all ended up working out. I like that. I like that a lot. I, and just to go back to that process, I, I really like how you flipped that and, and negotiated uh, your salary with that workplace. Because normally you have to, when you ask for a raise, it's kind of like, show me what you've done for me to earn this raise. And you're just like, well, I have another offer. So what are you going to do about it? <laughs> yeah. But you know, big companies are so stupid like that, right? Like they, oh, we're going to check on your review period. And then on your review period, we're going to do all oh, like, look at the last year. And it's just like, it's just, it, it's just bullshit. Like that that's not how people, sh yeah. It's just not how people should be compensated. Like once a year looking at it. Oh, uh, global, like cut our budget. So we can't possibly give you five grand more. It's like, yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's one process we, you, you guys probably want to avoid. So if anyone listening from a startup side, do not do that. <laughs> yes. Don't do that. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You like marketed yourself, which kind of brings us to my next point here. When you switched from uh, kind of a corporate environment to a startup environment, one of the biggest things is kind of like when you go into a job interview, you, you kind of just, you're trying to fit a mold for that company. Whereas a startup is kind of like, you have to be all over. Um, so how do you change uh, kind of your approach to make yourself more marketable when you're entering that startup world? You know, when I'm looking to hire people, you mean? For sure. Yeah. yeah. Or, or if, uh, from both perspectives, like from a hiring perspective, or if you're just trying to go into a startup yourself, um, how yeah. do you make yourself more marketable, especially when you're coming from a corporate background where you're more so fit to a mold, whereas a startup was like, you kind of, you have to be a Swiss army knife. I think if, if I can summarize it in one word, it's like relentlessness. I think that's what's required to succeed in, in, in startups. It's, it's just that never give up attitude, right? So like we love hiring CPAs at Luminary. Like I'm just about to hire three CPAs. Um, and you know, none of them have worked at startups. None of them have even worked in the job that I'm hiring them for, but they've all shown like this relentlessness to pursue the opportunity and to stop at nothing. And I think, you know, when you're a startup, like pretty much every startup is losing money every day, right? Like they're not profitable Yeah. and you need to like, you need to feel like your life is on the line in order to succeed. And so as a founder is typically the person you're interviewing with early days at a startup or somebody very senior, they, it's their baby. They really care about it. They want to hire people who are as passionate about this, solving this problem as they are. And so, you know, to anybody in the corporate world, who's thinking about getting involved in startups, I would say like, you know, <laughs> Like we post, sometimes we like, I'm looking for it and I don't find it. Like we post these jobs on LinkedIn. I'll give you a good example. Michael just is looking for a finance, my business partner is looking for a finance and operations person. 
And we were like, you know, what? Like, we don't want like a clear cut cookie cutter CPA. We're going to like put people on like a, a scavenger hunt. Right. So we put this job post on LinkedIn and at the top of the job post, we bolded it and put it in underline. Do not apply to this job on LinkedIn. Send us uh, your LinkedIn profile and a 90 second audio clip about what makes you different. If right. you apply to this job on LinkedIn, you will not move to the next round. <laughs> and like a hundred people have applied to this job on LinkedIn. And it's yep. just like, guys, like if you're going to succeed in a startup, don't do that. Like mm -hmm. attention to detail, follow the rules, but be creative. Like, yeah. You know, like you're talking to the business owner, like go and stand out some way. I don't know, like deliver a box of donuts or I don't know, do something, do something to get their attention to show that you're different because everybody yeah. who works at a startup is just you know, slightly yeah. fucked up. A Adam, now you had also an interesting story. We, we've talked about this before, but you want to explain Jesse's story? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Jesse, um, so, so we were launching our, um, our product LumaQ, the, the CPD podcast app that we'll, that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and we were looking for a salesperson. And so we put up this job um, and, and I met this guy who came to one of our events. He's actually the brother of a friend of mine or a guy I know, a friend. And, um, and I had two, I was left with two candidates and I really didn't know which candidate to choose. It was really hard. And it just got to a point where like, I just couldn't make up my mind about like who to hire. Um, and so we, um, we ended up kind of just delaying it a couple of weeks just to let the dust settle and see what happened. And in that time, this guy, Jesse, who we've now since hired, um, he went out, he asked me for our pitch deck. So I gave it to him. He went out and he started like canvassing CPAs who work at companies to see if he could pitch them on this product. And he went out and actually booked like a, a demonstration with like what is now one of our biggest clients because he ended up signing them after he joined. And he booked, he booked the meeting. He booked the demonstration with the entire finance team like before he ever started. And I was just like, how do I not, how do I not hire this person right now? Yeah. And so it's just like hustle like that. I mean, obviously that's a sales function hustle. I wouldn't expect a finance person to do that or a content person to do that. But I think it's about like showing how you're different. Um, and and getting people's attention yeah. yeah i love that a lot and and th that, that that's one of the biggest things that we try and kind of stress as well uh, when we're when we're looking at uh, people and applying for jobs and things like that it's kind of like what else can you bring right because everyone has everyone has the resume and kind of the expertise but what else are you going to bring to this company and so um, what yeah sorry go ahead no i was just going to stop you before you went on to the next question because there's a really good story for my advertising days about that yeah. So um, there's, there was a story that I got taught about in school where um, somebody was trying to be a creative person in an ad agency. And so they identified like 15 creative directors, whatever, like the boss, people of the creative department. Um, and they went on to Google AdWords and they started buying their names, like the Google, the Google AdWord names. Right. Yeah. yeah knowing that creative people are typically pretty vain and they like to Google themselves to see, <laughs> to see what the search results show up. And so what, it, what the Google AdWord said was, um, oh, interested in looking yourself up on Google, you're gonna be more interested in looking me up, check out my resume here. And of course, like these people were not famous people. So like it was very cheap to buy their AdWords and they ended up getting like five interviews and, and they got like, you know, I think all five job offers. But I, I thought that's just one of the greatest stories I've heard about somebody who got really creative about how to stand up. I love it. I love it. That's like the digital equivalent of that story of like the first person who kind of just walked up to the boss and just presented them like a gift box with their resume in it. Like, I don't know if you've heard that story. This is like the digital yeah. equivalent of that, you know? Yeah. But I, I love that. I love that. And so one of the biggest things that like, obviously we stress with people when we talk about, uh, about this topic and, and recruiting and, and separating yourself is also what kind of value do you bring uh, with your network, uh, because I think that's one of the biggest things that a, a person can bring. It's it's proof that you're providing people value. And so it, it's kind of just that extra step. And obviously, you have a, a sizable network uh, through LinkedIn and, and everything else. So how did you grow that network? And, and how did you kind of uh, curate that following? Uh, so I'll, I'll split up the answer to that question into two parts. How did I grow it? And then how do uh, you know, how, how's that? How have I kept it going? 
the, the growing part of it um, is a funny story. So early on when we launched the Luminary Job Board, we were trying to think about like, how do we get people to join this? Like we don't have any money for advertising. And so we noticed that CPAs tended to put the word CPA in their actual name on LinkedIn. So, right. you know, like I'm on Samra, CPA, right? And it just like has it, it's not like a job title. It's like, it's actually like you put it after his last name. Yeah. And so we started every day adding like hundreds and hundreds of CPAs to our LinkedIn accounts. And every time somebody would accept, we would manually, I mean, like not manually type out the message, but like manually copy and paste this message being like, hey, we just launched this job platform for CPAs. It's all about like passive candidates. We're only going to send you relevant stuff. It's free to join, you know, check it out and share it with your friends. And that's actually how we got our first 3000 users on the Luminary job platform was just via that strategy alone. And that allowed us to raise money, but story for another day. Um, so that's that, you know, you'd be amazed at like how many people just like accepted that request. And then even like we'd go to them and start asking them questions. Hey, how can we make the product better? How can we make the app better? And 50% of people I would say like ended up saying, sure, like I'm happy to chat with you on the phone to give you some feedback. Um, and I've just kept in touch with a lot of those people. Right. And, and so that was kind of, I guess like the beginning of the network and, and how I got, you know, probably on, well on my way to the 30,000 connections I have now or whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I think in terms of managing your network, that is a much more subtle and nuanced thing. Um, and this is kind of what I what, you know, what I try to tell everybody that I speak to who asks this question is like, you actually have to care about other people. Like you can't fake it. Right. And so I, I don't know, maybe I was just kind of born this way, but like I'm an extrovert. I feed off of other people's energy. And frankly, I get as much out of these relationships as they do, right? And so I, when I call somebody up and there's a whole number of people that I speak to once a quarter just to check in and see how they're doing, it's just, you, you have to ask them questions and actually care about the responses. Like you have to be a genuine person and, and yeah. And, and then I, I think people will respect that and, and you know, that's how your network grows. But I think it's the people who are only looking out for themselves that people can see through that and then they call bullshit and, and then they're, yeah. not, they're not actually somebody in your network. They're just somebody that you're connected to on LinkedIn. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, I, 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 so I just, I'm going through LinkedIn right now through Adam's messages. <laughs> ja January 19, 2017. That's when he sent that email out. So <laughs> um, there you go. And now look, and here we are four yeah, years exactly. later, right? Well, exactly. there you go. <laughs> so. I mean, yeah, it's always interesting. Uh, and then, yeah, exactly. You keep, you keep the network going. And uh, like you just mentioned, it's, it's about like keeping that relationship alive and, you know, not so much uh, abandoning it if you obviously have a connection with the person. Uh, and then, yeah, I've known Adam for four years now and honestly been the coolest person I've met personally. So, I mean, <laughs> uh, and like truly, like truly. And so uh, now let's kind of move on to Luminary itself, right? Sure. You, uh, before we get to Luminary, I want to talk about the startup idea that you had before, but it failed. Uh, so you, can, can you kind of walk through that and then how you kind of transition that off into uh, building out Luminary? Well, which, which idea that failed? Because I can tell you. I love that. I love that. I love that. Let's just say the one before that you started Luminary. Let's okay. Go. Okay. So well, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly, briefly explain the first one. Yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, we were in, I was in this corporate job at an ad agency. My business partner, Michael, his startup, not his, but the startup that he was working at in Ottawa was failing. And, uh, and he had come up with this idea on how to disrupt uh, the call center business. I won't get into the nitty gritty, but that is the reason why we quit our jobs. Like I handed in a 90 day notice to give them enough heads up. And that was the idea that we quit our jobs on. Eventually we found out that Facebook was launching business messenger. You know, same thing as like, you know, your personal right. messengers, just mm -hmm. you can talk to a business. I'm sure most people know that. Yeah. And we were like, Ooh, you know, like this isn't the idea that we were really doing, but we should probably not compete with Facebook. They already have all the people and all the businesses. That just seems like a bad idea. So we went back to the drawing board and one of the, the real idea that, that launched this, this product that we ended up spending four months on was, you know, this idea that like universities and college, maybe less so colleges, but universities do a really bad job of like preparing people for a career path. Um, they, they give you like the foundation depending on what program you're in, but they don't do a great job 
of actually like preparing you for a profession. Yeah. And so this idea was all about mentorship. And what we were going to do was connect somebody who was a working professional who started their education career path in the same place that you did. And you'd say, okay, like I am in psychology and I want to get into sales or I've gotten into sales and, and you'd be able to kind of like in a dating app, like swipe through and see, um, you know, oh, this person, this person ended up uh, doing the same, like was in the same education path as me and ended up getting into sales. That sounds really interesting. So we were going to connect those two people together for like an information interview. What's a day in the life? Um, you know, what do you do in your job? What parts do you like? What parts do you not like? Um, we quickly kind of realized that, um, that the mentors really liked this idea. So yeah. anybody over the age of 25 really, really liked the idea because either they or somebody they knew had been through a career change. The people under the age of 25 just didn't get it. Like they didn't realize that they had a problem. Right. Um, and so, you know, I'll pause on, on kind of why it failed, but basically Michael and I are, neither of us are technical, so we couldn't code the app ourselves. So we realized we really had to validate the idea before we went ahead and built anything. Cause we probably only had one chance at this. We were going to spend 30 or 40 of our own thousand dollars to, to hire somebody to build it or, or to use a dev shop. And so we really went hard on validation. I think we interviewed like 500 people all the way from high school up to like post-grad and to say to them, Hey, look, you know, we could help you, you know, do this. And the business model was we quickly realized that that mentors didn't want to profiteer off of giving advice. So we, we, we were like, we felt like we were so smart. We were like, Oh man, like, wouldn't it be so cool if the mentee could make a donation to the charity of the mentor's choice. And then the mentor it like is loving life because they're giving advice. They're feeling good about it. And they're also um, raising money for a charity that they care about. And it was yeah. like kind of micro donations, like whatever, 30 bucks to speak to somebody for 30 minutes or 60 minutes or whatever it was. And we would take like a small cut. And I remember at one point, like in classic kind of like accountant way, we did this like whole projection of like how much money we would make in tax credits based on like the, the velocity of doing all these calls. Anyways, this is such a stupid waste of time. But um, to get back to the reason why I failed, you know, after four months, we eventually got to a point where we were like, we should just no tech, try to get people to open up their wallets and pay for this. Yeah. And nobody would do it. Mm -hmm. Like, like there was, we were just gonna be like, okay, you know, uh, Amon, you want to speak to somebody in fashion? We'll go to our network. We'll find somebody who works in fashion and you guys will just call each other and you'll send us a check we'll donate it to charity, you know, whatever. And nobody would do it. And, and kind of what we realized was that these young kids, they didn't realize they had a problem. They were kind of viewing it as like, oh, I'll just get into the workforce and I'll figure it out. And um, I remember specifically the day that we decided to kill the idea. I was over at my friend's house. He had, he had a younger sister who was in high school. She was in grade 12. And like, we were pretty downtrodden at this point. Like it was not working. And so I was running her through these research questions that we had developed. And I said, you know, Nicole, like, what do you know what you want to be, you know, after, after you go to university? And she's like, yeah, I want to be a judge. It's like, wow, that's amazing. Like you have such a specific example, like what a great career path that you've chosen. Like you must've done a lot of research to get there. Why do you want to be a judge? Well, I really like watching judge Judy. And I was like, Oh <laughs> no, like this is not going to work. You know, like these kids, they're just, they just fly in the wind. Right. And I even had their parents willing to pay to, to do the service because they were spending 30 or 40 grand sending yeah, them to university. Yeah. What's a couple hundred bucks to make sure that they're choosing the right course. But anyways, I, I mean, that was, that was the idea. It was called buys, uh, like advice, advice. Uh, and, and it failed. And I'm glad that we didn't pursue it because I think in another universe, like a parallel universe, we would have pursued it. We would have spent all of our money doing that. And then we wouldn't have been able to start Luminary. Yeah, you probably be working full time at a corporate right now. Then, <laughs> yes, exactly. Back, my, biggest, yes. my biggest nightmare. Yeah. All right. So uh, now, Luminary. So explain that platform and why it's benefiting uh, CPAs such as myself. Okay. Well, this might be some news to you, because <laughs> we haven't talked in a while. But we've actually shut Luminary down. Wow. Um, so we're keeping okay. the pivot train going. I, I mean, look, when we launched Luminary, I'll spare you the great details because we pivoted mm -hmm. around a while to get to the to get to the idea that ended up working a bit. 
Um, Luminary was a career management platform for mm. CPAs. So we, we started with helping CPAs find jobs. The real, like the real value prop there was relevancy. Like this yeah. concept that like, you know, you go to LinkedIn and you type uh, finance manager and LinkedIn's like, oh great, you want to be a restaurant manager? And you're like, no, screw you LinkedIn. Like, <laughs> why are you, you know, anyways. So, so that was the initial concept was like job listening. Right. Like if, if only if, if you were only served up relevant jobs, then you would keep track of the job market all the time. The reason why you don't want to go looking for jobs every week is because you have to sort through 100 pages yeah. to get to the three jobs that you're actually interested in. So that's how we launched. Uh, we started adding other services to that. Um, so like we started a mentorship program. We helped CPAs find volunteer opportunities at charities and not for profits. We started doing events. We bring in really cool speakers and, and fill the room with like 200 people. Mm-hmm. Um, all of that kind of was just what we realized was like a lifestyle business. Um, like we were making a couple hundred grand a year. You know, Michael and I just wanted to fire everybody and run that. Like we probably could have and, and mm-hmm. made like a pretty decent business for ourselves. But it was very, very hard to scale. Uh, and, and that's really the lesson that I've learned about marketplaces is like we needed candidates and we needed jobs at the exact same time in every new location we wanted to be in. And so we, you know, we got to like 15,000 members, but then we were like, well, how do we start in Vancouver? We needed 3000 candidates, active candidates and, and 30 job posts every month. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just like when companies were paying us $800 in a transactional purchase, it was just very, very hard to right. scale. Yeah. Right. And so you know, there was a lot of Valley of Soros is kind of how you a term in the startup world <laughs> that you go through to when things aren't working. And, and uh, about two years ago was when we came up with the original idea for LumaQ. And, and that is essentially what the company is no, yeah, right okay. now. Um, so we've dropped everything else. Uh, and we're about to let the Luminary community know that. So if they hear it here first, uh, apologies. All right. We got some exclusive. You got a tip. scoop. Yeah. Got we got hot takes. Yeah. Yeah. Insider <laughs> trading or whatever you want to call it. So, uh, I mean, okay. So Luminary is now essentially LumiQ. Um, mm-hmm. And so you've noticed that was kind of the right path to go on. And so essentially uh, explain that now. Um, yeah. I know for those of our viewers that don't know, it is a podcast platform where you can get professional development hours. Um, so as a CPA, I need to get professional development hours. Um, and I'm a personal user of LumiQ. So thank you for building out the platform because yeah. God knows I don't want to do three hours of tax reviews and stuff like that. It's the worst thing. So yeah, walk me through that and how you guys came up with the idea. Sure. So that was, um, it was a real, so we were part of um, a, a startup accelerator called the Creative Destruction Lab. And um, we had had this mentor throughout that process who was actually one of the co-founders of Wattpad. Do you guys know Wattpad? Yep. 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 The, the crowdsource book platform, I guess. And she was really challenging us. I mean, everybody at CDL, Creative Destruction Lab, was challenging us. Like, this is a lifestyle business. Like, why? how did you get into Creative Destruction Lab? <laughs> you shouldn't be here. <laughs> and so um, we, were pretty, we were pretty devastated. And, um, you know, look, I, I think it was a byproduct of us going through the experience of three and a half years of running this business that we recognized that all these CPAs that we were speaking to really just had this huge disdain for getting these professional development hours. It's not just CPA. It's like every profession, uh, every professional designation has this and they all hate doing it. Um, And so the actual, the original idea actually was spawned by my wife because at the time she was really into HQ. Do you guys remember HQ trivia? I personally don't know. Okay. So HQ was like, you guys should research it. It was this crazy flash in the pan fad. Um, it was an app out of Silicon Valley. And what they did is every night at nine o'clock, there was a live trivia session. They'd have millions of people downloading the app and logging in exactly at nine o'clock. And you'd have to answer 10 questions that increased in complexity. And if whoever was left at the end who had answered all 10 questions right, they split a prize. Oh, right. Okay. right. And it was like, to- it went like totally viral. It was crazy. They're now bankrupt and totally defunct. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it goes to show you how, how quickly these things can come and go. But um, the or- original idea, I remember like going to Michael's apartment after that creative destruction lab session, being really depressed and like being like, how are we going to save this business? And, uh, and, and we came up with this original idea based on my wife using like every night at nine o'clock, whatever we were doing, she stopped mm-hmm. and went to play HQ. And I was like, could we do HQ for CPD? Like, could we log on at nine o'clock every night and ask people accounting questions 
and give them like whatever, 10 or 20 minutes of CPD every single night. And that was the original idea. Um, and then we, we like, you know, like we always had, we went out and tested it with CPAs and just spoke to hundreds and hundreds of CPAs about it. Eventually realized that people didn't like that concept of it. Um, but that they re that really did like podcasts and podcasts were trending and people, um, wanted it on demand. They liked the idea of a podcast because they could do it on the go whenever they had time on their commute. Um, and, and so that was really how we came up with the initial conception of LumaQ. And it's largely remained unchanged since then. I mean, we've added a lot of stuff mm -hmm. to it. But essentially what it is, is it's a native podcast app. So it's on, on uh, the Apple Store or, or, uh, or Spotify. We've built our own app. We go out and interview kind of like this. I mean, I, we, we interview people that are much more successful than me, but we interview people <laughs> that are uh, really cool and, and successful. And we ask them about an expertise that they've developed um, or an experience they've had. So, you know, an experience we interviewed Mike Katchen, the founder of Wealth Simple, yeah. about how he scaled the business up to $4 billion assets under management. Um, so that was like really, really cool. We've interviewed uh, the chair of the board of Hudbay Minerals all about shareholder activism. Mm -hmm. you know, what do you do when, when shareholders are rising? Jim Balsilli as well. Right. Jim Balsilli, um, the inventor of Amazon Alexa. Like we've had some really cool guests. And so that's how we've kind of changed the content side of it instead of, to Amon's point, you know, you know, listening to some tax uh, webinar, of yeah. the Income Tax Act, you get to listen to these really cool people. It's more of a conversation. And I would argue you learn a lot more from listening to these people who've accomplished so much in their career versus, you know, some senior manager of tax at, at yeah. some accounting firm. Yeah. And I, I, th I think even with the shift with uh, individuals going to more of a kind of tech consistent role, people want to get involved in that industry. I think you guys are kind of spot on with the content that you're creating kind of spurs that interest and innovation. Like uh, a lot of my friends who are CPAs hate the public accounting life now and they want to transition off into something else, but they're kind of stuck and don't know how. So I think this is a great platform to kind of consume um, and get some ideas on how to shift or how to create. And so I think kudos to you guys to making this available to uh, suckers like us who have uh, been uh, struggling for many years dealing with crappy content and boring stuff. Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah, awesome. And so uh, one of the things I also want to talk about, like from the, we, we talked about this cookie thing at the beginning of the show. And yeah. so um, that was originally when you guys were building out Luminary, but eventually that has built, uh, like for me personally, that was like a sign of trust and, you know, you guys cared about who your user base is. So talk to me about the value of how important trust is to any brand and the longevity of it. Yeah, I mean, you know, look, I, I, the way that we always imagine Luminary, and it still holds the kind of same thing in terms of a branding perspective for LumaQ is to, to use a sports analogy, like we want to be the, play, the, the players association of the CPA community. Right. Like we want to represent the CPA community to the broader audience, right? right. To the broader public. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, now that's taken the role of like, how do we train CPAs to prepare for this future that I, I think a lot of people are uncertain around, right? Like we, we know that technology is, is going to automate a lot of what, you know, CPAs jobs are, but how do we train people for that inevitability? Because right now, like they don't know how to, you know, they don't know machine learning, like no CPA I know knows how to code in machine learning. So, right. um, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the mantra that we take now, you know, originally with the trust, I mean, I think it was, it was really just about like, how do we differentiate ourselves? Um, and, and, you know, that kind of, I guess I'll take this question and kind of dovetail it into two strategies that we employed that were successful. Um, one was the cookie strategy. And with that, we were just trying to be different. Like, you know, I remember, so my, my friend owns the business, um, that does the, the branded cookie. So he puts okay, your logo okay. like inside of a shortbread cookie. And I was like, man, like, wouldn't it be crazy if we just waited outside of the CPA exams? and handed out cookies to everybody who left. Because at the time we were looking for job candidates, we figured, hey, these people are probably gonna get their letters pretty soon, They're, they should you know, they should know about us. Um, and then it kind of took off from there when we started posting about it on LinkedIn and Instagram. And you know, it worked so well that I remember for like a couple of years, we, in the summer, we would, we had this like big sign, are you a CPA? We wanna give you a free cookie. And we put it on a stick and we'd just walk around downtown Toronto, like holding yeah. up a sign, like we were protesting. 
and it made like some of our staff really uncomfortable doing this because like they, you know, like people would look at you really weird. Like why, like, huh, what are you protesting CPAs? Like what? Um, but what you would notice is as you're walking down the street, you could kind of look into people's eyes and nine out of 10 people thought you were like the weirdest person they'd ever met. And then the one person out of 10 who was a CPA would like smile and laugh. Um, and, and so just like stuff like that was just a way of like being like, Hey, here's who we are. We're not, we can't take out TV ads, but we want to be a part of this community. And, and, mm -hmm. you know, I think it was just more genuine and authentic. Um, you know, the, the other side of like trust and transparency, which is like a really big part of our, our company culture. And it's something we try to do internally and externally is, you know, to go kind of circle back to the LinkedIn, um, uh, community that we've built. One of the things that we learned really early on about CPAs is they're just fascinated with how businesses run. So we would pitch people like the job board idea and people would go like, so how do you make money? Right? Like they'd start like trying to unpack the business. And so what we realized was that like we could basically just it's like um, there's another company that's kind of coined this term called reality TV marketing, right. where you like take what's happening in your company and you just like open up the curtains. Like you're not like, you know, putting financial statements out onto LinkedIn, but like you open up the curtains in terms of the struggles and the successes and, you know, everything that you're going through trying to build up a company. And that's something that we'd started doing early on. And I think that probably has benefited us probably more than the cookie thing is just like saying like, Hey, look, like we're struggling entrepreneurs. We're going to make mistakes. We want to share the lessons that we've learned doing that. And you know, here's, here's our story. And, and it's, it's worked really well. I think it's resonated with CPAs because they like understanding how businesses work. I still like the cookie though. Like I, I want that yeah. too though, right? <laughs> I still have some, man. I can give you, I can give you a couple. hundred percent. I'm holding you to that. <laughs> like a couple, couple years expired, but that's okay, right? Yeah, no, they're, they're individually packaged. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> so one of the things you touched on there that I want to kind of dive into was automation, like helping CPAs uh, deal with automation. Obviously, it automation is kind of like good and bad. It's slowly chipped away at kind of the technical side of things. Um, and, but it's also allowed CPAs to focus more on advisory, uh, where I think is where you can provide the most value uh, as a CPA. Uh, but I wanted to get your perspective on that and, and kind of what other areas automation will benefit CPAs in terms of where they can focus on uh, their day-to-day -day, uh, work. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I want to start with a little bit of a story um, to, to illustrate the point. So, we were in Creative Destruction Lab, this startup accelerator, and, and part of it near the end was that you'd get up in front of this big room of like the, Canada's like most successful entrepreneurs. Like every single person there was like some huge VC flying in from Silicon Valley or the guy who started Win Mobile or this guy who was like building a startup to like go to the moon, like just like big time people. And so Michael and I get up there and we present our vision for this career management platform. And all of a sudden we get this hand, somebody raises their hand from the back row and we're like, yeah, sure. Like you have a question. And he's like, I won't name his name. Cause you know, you guys might know who he is. He says, my company is, is automating CPAs. And so in five years, there won't be a CPA. And that's going to be a big problem for your business because you can't manage their career if there are none. Right. And our response which was really nerve wracking at the time <laughs> to get up in this room and to battle this guy who's like, you know, a hundred millionaire is we said, you know, look, 80% of the work that CPAs do is compliance and 20% is advisory, but 80% of the value that CPAs bring is in advisory and 20% is in compliance. So we actually look at technological innovation and automation as a benefit, as a you know, speaking on behalf of the CPA community, because CPAs will just be able to spend more time on the stuff that they're already good at, which is providing advisory work, right? And, um, you know, I think that kind of illustrates the point of, you know, where we see, at least where I see this going is like, you know, look, after having done this for five years, CPAs get a bad rap, right? Like CPAs, they're, the, they're equated to the number crunchers with the green visor and the pocket protector. And that's just not reality. And anybody who thinks that is living in an outdated world. Um, you know, CPAs are so good at so many different things that bring on the automation. You know, like I, I have a friend uh, who works at uh, a company called IBI Group, and they've been really pushing robotic process automation. And they'll like come into your company and they'll like, like do interviews with each of the departments and evaluate what their day-to-day -day job looks like. And like he was telling me this story where like, 
you know, somebody in HR like explains how they onboard like candidates who apply right. to a position. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, he can go in there with his CPAs, who by the way, all get taught how to code in Python and they automate the entire process. And like, yeah, maybe like some of those employees don't like it because part of their job gets automated out. <laughs> but you know, look, I think that ultimately that is the way that the world is going. That is what we should embrace. And CPAs as a profession should focus on, okay, where are the added values that I can insert myself? Because as much as technology can automate, you know, a, a big part of our jobs, it's never going to automate advice, mm -hmm. right? I mean, like you got to be living in like some crazy Jetsons world where like you go to some computer and be like, I need to raise $5 million <laughs> for my business. Tell me how to do it. Right. Like yeah. that's not going to happen. And right. so, you know, I think we can talk about like, what are the skill sets CPAs need to, to be able to do that, which is a totally different question. But when I think about automation and, and what it's going to do to the CPA world, I, I think every CPA should be welcoming it and should be preparing for it. It should be making sure that they're on the right side of history as opposed to the person who's 45 years old and who gets automated out of a job and who didn't prepare for it and can't get a new one. Yeah. And I can definitely attest to that because, uh, uh, a lot of the roles I've been in, they like, have senior managers that are much older than I am, and they say, hey, uh, automate everything, right? What's the definition of automate everything? Um, and so I, I always come with the mindset of, okay, we can automate certain areas, but at the end of the day, that's just a facilitation of my work and my help towards giving you value in some, in this case, advisory, right? So it's not going to give all your answers just because I implemented XYZ software to help you with this. That means nothing, right? And uh, for all the CPAs out there, you probably know that a number doesn't mean anything unless there's a story or context behind it. The same kind of logic applies to automation and the data you get out of it. There has to be another story that you kind of fill and push out of it. So um, yeah, good points there, Adam. I mean, if anything, the numbers are tricky because yeah. if all you're looking at is numbers and you have no context, you're, you're very likely to make a wrong decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 100%, 100%. So on that note, like if I'm, if I'm a student, I'm kind of following that CPA path right now and I'm getting designated or I'm in school in, a, in an accounting program, um, what should I be focusing on in anticipation of this? Like it, as I come out into the workforce, there's going to be more automation every year that's going to kind of reduce the technical work that I have to do. So where should CPA, uh, I mean, current CPAs and students be focusing uh, their studies and, and their continuing education when you're dealing with this? I mean, it really depends on where you want to go. I know a lot of students might not know what they want to do after they get their letters. Like I speak to a lot of CPAs that view the designation as a foundation to go do something else. And that's great. And if you can go work at one of the big accounting firms, I think the training that you get there is invaluable and it'll help you later on in your career. Um, I, if I could summarize it in, in, in a few words, it would be to have a really strong sense of intellectual curiosity. And so that encompasses a lot of things to me, right? It encompasses, yeah, learning how to code in Python would be a great start. Learning, you know, Power BI tools. Yeah. Um, you know, learning, uh, obviously you need to master Excel. Um, you know, learning like software and tools that you'll be able to bring to a team of accounting and finance people where you'll be able to add value. Right. Like I have somebody on my team who's kind of like my automation guru guy. And I'm always amazed that he like looks at a problem in a different sort of way because he looks at it and goes like, OK, how could I combine these tools together? Like Zapier is a really I don't know yeah. if you guys know Zapier, yeah. but like an amazing yeah. tool that allows you to automate tasks like very like very um, repeatable tasks between softwares. Um, I think if you walked into an organization as a junior accountant, and you were able to add value in those different ways. I mean, you could, you could do whatever you want with your career because you will always be an extremely sought after person, but you know, that that's just the beginning. I think you need to internalize that. You just need to be curious about everything in the world. Like those are the tools that we use now. What's right. going to happen in three to five years, go pick up a book, go read fiction, nonfiction, like learn just every day, try to learn about something new. And then take what you've learned and, and apply it to, to your job. And whether that's creative problem solving or whether that's how to win friends and influence people or whether it's some tool that you use that could help you down the road, it doesn't even help you now. I, I think that not only will that help you succeed once you get a job, but it will, it will allow you to tell a better story 
once you apply for a job because one of the, yeah. the hard parts with these kids coming out of school is that like the only difference that you see on a resume is what school you went to, maybe some volunteer opportunities or some internships, but that doesn't really amount to much, right? Like I, I talked to a lot of hiring managers when they're hiring somebody who doesn't have any experience, it really just comes down to personality and culture. And sometimes you might not even get the interview and then you're wondering what you did wrong. But right. I'll tell you, like if you wrote a cover letter or if at the top of your resume, you said, well, basic understanding of Python, understand how to use Zapier, um, understand how to use like different, you know, software and automation tools, Power BI, um, uh, you would have an extremely big leg up on getting that interview, which is ultimately the goal of, of applying mm -hmm. to jobs, right? Yeah, yeah, and for sure. Uh, one thing I can also add there is like, for any industry that you're going into, like look at the trends that are happening within that industry, and then you'll start picking up on certain things. Like uh, not all industries need sort of automation or certain things, but uh, in many cases, you'll find like specific pieces of software that you might need or specific skill sets that you need. So it is also industry uh, specific. So you can, again, to Adam's point, start reading books on those things, but know what you're try trying to get yourself into first before trying to master everything and being like the jack of all trades per se. Yeah. And, and, you know, to, just to further that point, you should go before you do any of this stuff, you should go and talk to people. Yeah. Right. Like go and just reach out to people that are working after having gotten designation, or even if they're not a CBA, you're just in a liberal arts program, go and ask people, what do you do every day? You'd be amazed if you just start adding people on LinkedIn that you think have cool job titles and they 50% of them will accept your request. And then you just send them a message and send them a follow message and then send them a third follow message, um, asking them to just chat about their day to day. What do you do every day? What's your job like? What parts do you like? What parts do you not like? Believe me, everybody doesn't like parts of their job. Everybody loves parts of their job. Uh, it reminds me of a really good piece of advice we got from an investor early on. And they told us, um, when you ask somebody for money, you get advice. And when you ask somebody, when you ask somebody for advice, you get money. <sighs> And so, you know, the same thing applies to investors, but it also applies to jobs. If you just reached out to like 50 people and had conversations with 50 people about their job and just ask them the advice, like have no agenda other than asking their advice and learning from them, I guarantee you, you're going to get some job offers because people are going to like you. For sure. For sure. And, and to the point of kind of continuous development and being curious, um, I, I think one thing that came out in the last week was that Ontario is, is mandating coding into uh, elementary school as part of like the curriculum now so it's kind of like if you've if you're out of school now and and you think hey i'm in accounting i don't need to know coding it's like now it's foundational to everyone coming up so it's like you got to go back and learn that right yeah so i like and that. I find that and i find sorry i started to interrupt but i just find that once you learn basic coding it's re it's a lot easier to teach yourself how to code in other languages yeah right 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 and so amongst all that one of the things that you touched on was there's a lot of students or, or, or professionals as well that are kind of in the workforce or kind of in a program or something. And they're like, this is it. Uh, I, this isn't what I wanted. Right. Um, and, and, and you're like the king of pivoting as we've talked a lot in this conversation. Um, you don't have a CPA designation, but you're kind of like a CPA expert based on, uh, uh, based on luminary and LumiQ and kind of your experiences through that. So when you when you look at someone who's kind of, um, in a position where they kind of just followed the, the, the education and got their designation or whatever it is. And now they're like, Hey, I don't, I don't know what to do now. Cause I, I only went into this kind of tunnel vision and now I don't know what to do. How do you, how do you kind of, how do you kind of start that process of pivoting out into a different field or, or a different industry? Like how do you even start that process? I think to, to go back, I mean, it may sound repetitive, but it's just, you know, go and talk to people who work in different industries and you don't know who, you might, you know, who you might end up speaking to and what industry you might end up enjoying. Right. Um, you know, like with us, it was more of a matter of like, I had to learn how to speak CPA, right? CPA. Yeah. Um, because in sales and marketing, like you have to understand your customer. And so after having so many conversations with people, you just end up picking up on the vernacular and the lingo. You know, for other people who are exploring other things, I, I, I see so many people who you know, or at the firms and they go, I hate doing this. I want to get into financial reporting. And guess what? They get into financial reporting and they hated that too. Yeah. And right. they should have, they, they should have done their research before then. I mean, my business partner, Michael's got a crazy story. He was at EY. He got his letters at EY. And then he was like, you know what? Like, I don't like audit. I'm going to go be a consultant. I like talking to people. 
Right. So he went and became a risk management consultant and he hated that. And then he was like, screw this. I want to go do something that I'm passionate about. I've spent the last five years doing something that I just have to do. I'm going to go do something I'm passionate about. So he did what every good CPA does. And he quit his job to go take a master's degree in counterterrorism. Okay. Um, <laughs> standard career path. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then what was interesting, he loved that program. He got into that program and he went to go work in Scotiabank in the security department, not securities. Like actual, like Scotiabank has a department that analyzes counterterrorism threats. And his mm -hmm. responsibility was for Latin America and like the drug trade. Like what happens if like a dirty bomb goes off and, you know, uh, Buenos Aires or something. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah right. Sounds cool. But guess what? He just sat behind a desk all day doing research and writing reports. And he's like, this is exactly the same thing as audit. Well, like, you know, so I, I think if you were to ask him now, if he had gone and spoken to somebody who actually worked in the field that he was signing up to spend his whole, like to, to spend a year of his time learning about, he probably wouldn't have chosen that. I mean, it all ended up working out, but I, I think not enough people go out and just find random people who are doing what sounds like cool jobs and just talk to them about what their life is like. And if yeah. people did that, they would, they would be a lot happier. Probably. Hey, that's what we're doing right now. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. We're trying, man. We're trying. And so, uh, one of the stories that I found most fond of, uh, with Luminary and LumiQ is John's story, right? So, uh, he, he came out, he, uh, I'm going to actually let you tell the story, but to kind of sum it up, he actually started out as a volunteer, right? And yeah. now he works full time in customer service. So how did that all happen? And what, what about John uh, kind of sold you on his kind of persona and who he was? I mean, it, 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 we're, we're going to be, you know, circling back on a couple of big themes here. So, yeah. so we, we ran um, like for a time period, we were running an event every month. And I got connected to somebody at York University in the accounting program and they wanted us to come and speak. Um, to the accounting program there. And so I just like passed it off to Michael. I was like, you're the CPA, like you go and deal yeah, with this. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have to. <laughs> and I don't know how, but John somehow, and he wasn't even in the accounting program. He somehow ended up being at that talk and got really inspired by Michael. And then I guess found out about our events that was happening every month. And he just started signing up. And so he, I think he came to one or two events and then at the end of those events, you know, we sat around and chit chatted with people who showed up and he, he came over and spoke to me and he started asking like really interesting questions about the business and trying to unpack it and understand it. Um, and it was, uh, it was just, it was, it was really awesome. Like obviously every entrepreneur likes when people ask, like try to unpack their business and, mm -hmm. and tackle it from like that complex problem solving angle. Um, so I think the story went that from there, he, he really wanted to, to get experience with startups. And so we let him come down once a week, one day a week, to come and help out with like random tasks. I think early on it was like really shitty stuff that we were getting him to do like social media posts and like, you know, sending out like t-shirts and I don't know, like whatever, like whatever crappy work that we didn't want to do, we just gave to him. And so he did that for like six months. We didn't pay him anything. And I was like, oh, look, we can't afford to pay you. He's like, no problem. Like I'm coming down every week once, once, you know, and then about six months later he came to me and he was like, okay, Adam, like, you know, like I want to drop out of school and come work for you guys full time. And I was like, man, like, I can't let you do that. Right. And in my mind, I was like, we have hired and fired so many people that yeah. if this kid drops out of school and then comes and joins us, like I thought he was good, but who knows if I had to fire this kid and he dropped out of school, I'd never forgive myself. And, um, and so he's like, no, like, I really want to do this. Like I'm determined, like, like I won't take no for an answer. I was like, look, man, like I, I, I no, the answer is no. Let's, you know, let's not talk about it for a little bit. And every week when he came into work, he would, he would just keep pushing and keep pushing and keep pushing and started adding more and more value. Um, eventually got to a point where he was coming in like a couple days a week. And so eventually we got to a point where he was just so adamant about joining the team that we said, okay, fine. Why don't we do this? Why don't you change your degree from a four-year degree to a, a three-year degree? So at least you graduate with something. You can do school on the side, like take like two classes a semester or something to get that, that right. certificate and you'll work full time for us. And this guy for a year worked like nine to nine every day at Luminary and wow. then went and did his school stuff after, after that. And whatever, he took a couple of days off to do his exams or whatever. 
you know, passed, got, you know, he, he you know, he graduated. Um, I mean, it's even crazy. Like a month ago, I was looking at my shared calendar and in John's calendar, it was like graduation pictures. I was like, man, graduate. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I almost yeah, yeah. forgot this guy just graduated. <laughs> Look, I think the lesson there is like, it goes back to that relentlessness. Like we just saw something in him. He just would not take no for an answer. And when somebody's that passionate and that relentless and tenacious, he was like a terrier. Like he just got it in his mouth and he just like wouldn't let go. I just had to hire him. Like I just had to. And I look back on it now. He is, I mean, he's 23 years old and he is like so integral to what we accomplish as a company every day. I can't right. imagine Luminary without John. Yeah. He, shout out, shout like, out John. Shout, shout out, out John, John. For real. Yeah. That is yeah. amazing. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. And he like, he came to Canada when he was 16 years old. Like, like this guy, like, I mean, he's really, he's really succeeded and, and yeah. I, I give him all the credit in the world. I don't want to call it quote unquote, but I almost call it a rags to riches story in his sense. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, for yeah. So, uh, I mean, that also brings up to us to the point where there's a lot of younger individuals that have also asked me, they probably asked you for volunteer positions, but sometimes um, they don't know how to approach that. So you've already touched on the value of volunteering and gaining experience, but Again, the approach once someone should take to volunteer um, and show passion, how, how, how about do they go around that? Look, I struggle with it, right? Like I did an mm. unpaid internship when I started my career in advertising. I did a four month unpaid internship. I, I understand the whole conversation that we should not be getting students to do unpaid internships because right. it adversely benefits the people who can afford to go four months without being paid. Exactly. Right? Like I, to I totally understand yes. that. Um, at the same time, companies like ours at that point in time, we could not afford to pay somebody. So it was a zero sum game. Either we had an unpaid intern or we didn't have anybody at all. And, you know, in that situation, I know that the unpaid internship really helped me. I mean, I ended up getting a job at the company that I interned at. It helped me put something on my resume. It helped show that I had gusto and experience and you know, I think it really benefited me. It obviously benefited John. I know a lot of other examples of it benefiting people. I think like, obviously if you're capable of doing it, it can be really helpful. If you're not able to do it, then you, you have to narrow your search. Not narrow. I mean, there's still a huge amount of companies that will be able to pay you. If you want to go work at a startup, it's going to be really hard. Right. Um, so you probably want to stick to bigger companies. You know, if you want to volunteer your time, like John did while he was still in school, I think we go back to like reaching out to people, asking for a call, learning about what they do. Uh, I'm like thinking in my head now, like I'm telling people <laughs> yeah, these yeah, advice yeah. and now I'm going to have like a thousand messages on LinkedIn. Um, but look, it's, it's, it's just don't, don't take no for an answer. I mean, eventually you do need to take no for an answer, <laughs> but um, you know, just keep hustling. And, and maybe that person that you reached out to doesn't have an opportunity for you, but they know somebody who does. And, and that's, you know, it's not the way the world really does work. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, at all these jobs, like, it's funny because I ran a job board for three and a half years, but if I was out of work right now and I was looking for a job, I would not be applying on a job board. Yeah. Right? I'd, be calling, the world works. I'd be calling Adam, hey, do you know anyone? <laughs> 100%. <laughs> so, what we like to do with all of our guests is kind of doing uh, a, a bit of a lightning round where we kind of toss a bunch of questions at you. And this is meant to just uh, get split second answers so we can fully understand you aside, outside of the work and, and all of that background. So I'm going to shoot some questions at you and you got maybe like 10 to 20 seconds here to answer it. Just first things that come to mind. No pressure at all. Um, so first off, what is your favorite book of all time? I would split those up into two categories. So fiction is Ender's Game and the entire Ooh. Ender's Game series. If you're into like sci-fi, that. that is an amazing book. Do not watch the movie. It sucks. Yep. Um, Nonfiction is probably the uh, trilogy biography of Theodore Roosevelt. Okay. So uh, he was a president of the United States, like in the early 1900s. You know that Dos Equis commercial, the most interesting yeah. man in the world? Theodore Roosevelt was the most interesting man in history. Uh, crazy stories. This guy one time got shot while he was doing a presidential speech and continued the speech until the end. Yep. If you're going to read one nonfiction book, Theodore wow. Roosevelt biography. Okay, sweet. Love it. Love it. So 
you have a hard day at work, you come home, how do you unwind? What's your way, what's your best choice uh, to kind of chill out and, and relax? I'm going to give you the honest answer here. Um, probably a joint, a glass of scotch, <laughs> uh, watching TV with my wife. Um, I don't know. I, I, I mean, A, I'm not coming home after a long day of work right now. I'm at home doing work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah. that kind of, you know, changes sure. things. I work, a lo- I work a lot, right? So like yeah. I'm usually working until like nine or nine. I don't know how my wife puts up with me, but I'm usually working pretty late. So uh, yeah, it's usually a joint, maybe a glass of scotch. I love it. You went the Elon Musk way. You're just like, you're on a podcast. <laughs> I'm like, hey, I just smoke a joint. It's fine. Yeah. It's legal. It's legal. Yeah. It's just the same Good as one. drinking a glass of scotch, right? So. All right. So uh, on LinkedIn, I actually saw, I saw your post recently. You celebrated your first wedding anniversary. Happy anniversary. Thank you. Having dealt with quarantine throughout all the situation right now, what is your best <laughs> marriage advice or maybe lesson that you've learned throughout all this? Ooh, I've learned that my wife is an amazing cook. <laughs> I knew that before, <laughs> but I'm eating the best out of anybody in all of Canada right now during quarantine. Seriously. All right. Um, look, I mean, I, I think the most important thing that I've learned, and this is true in quarantine or not quarantine, is that you need to have your own personal life too. There are some nights where we just kind of separate and I go do my thing and she does her thing Mm -hmm. and that's cool. Right. Um, I think having time for yourself and, you know, having some time to kind of reevaluate and and introspect, you know, look, look look internally is, is really important and and keeps people sane. For sure. For sure. For sure. So last question here, and maybe this won't be so applicable because your wife's been cooking great food for you, but (laughs) when you guys get pizza, do you get pineapples on her or no? I would get pineapples on my pizza, <laughs> but yes, uh, she doesn't like them, so we don't get them. Oh, man. Yeah. So, <laughs> she's actually allergic to pineapples, okay. which is weird. Okay. Raw pineapples, she's allergic to. So cooked pineapples are good. But as a result, she just doesn't really like pineapples. And, and you know, as much as you can try to separate them half and half, there's a little bit of crossover in the middle right. sometimes. Yeah. The juices yeah. flow over it. it is yeah. Like- a risk we can't take, unfortunately. Okay. Totally fair. Totally fair. Man, I got to start trying pineapple on pizza. I don't know. (laughs) Like every guest that we have, it's a yes. And I get roasted afterwards. It's that Do you like pineapple in general? Yeah, I like pineapple in general, but I just find it weird on a pizza. (laughs) It is what it is. Yeah. All right, man, Adam, this was honestly like a really fun conversation. And we, again, want to truly, uh, Thank you for being on and, uh, you know, uh, share us to any last notes here. Yeah, no, for sure. This was a great conversation. Uh, there's a lot of takeaways from this, um, even for ourselves. I think uh, we can talk about this off air as well, but like a, a lot of uh, pivoting advice kind of like that. I, I like that a lot. And I think that's, we're going to have a lot of individuals kind of faced with that dilemma, especially with the current climate as well, when they're realizing a lot of things. Um, so I think you've touched on a lot of important notes that uh, are very valuable to, to our audience. So thank you so much for, for being part of this. Awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it.